Welcome everyone as you're filing in. Thanks for attending this morning. You know, I feel like if this were uh, a, uh, a physical space, you would have people greeting you at the door and thanking you for coming in. So I'm gonna pretend to do that right now. Sam, would there be banter prior to the official discussion? Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, as people are walking in, it was so good to see you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I'm, I am loving your haircut. That's not just a thing that I'm saying to fill time. Did you do that in-house? I did that myself, yes. That's a, that's a personal job. I'm not interested in going out to do that yet, so. I like it. I, I've personally take the, taken this as a, a time to experience what happens uh, mm -hmm. to my hair, uh, and it's really happening. It's all happening in a way that I would not have anticipated. And now we're all experiencing it. <laughs> <laughs> like it or not, you are. Okay, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna roll. I see the, <clears throat> the attendees coming in here, which is wonderful. Uh, so good morning, everyone. And welcome to uh, another installment of this webinar series that the Ability Center is um, really, really privileged and excited about putting together. You know, our goal through the midst of this um, this coronavirus, um, really global pandemic and health crisis that has kind of shifted the, the ground beneath our feet in ways we never anticipated. Our goal is to make sure that we're doing everything we can to connect our consumers to vital information um, in, in the moment that we currently that we currently live. And so we put together this webinar series to tackle these issues, to bring on guests who can speak to these issues in a meaningful way. And this is the next installment of that. Um, I am really excited that on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, this is our subject. Um, accessibility in, in many different ways than what we would normally think. Um, but before we get there, just a couple quick notes. Um, if you are on the Zoom call, there is a chat where you are encouraged to leave questions and I'll pull those up toward the end of our conversation. If you are also potentially watching on Facebook, um, I would encourage you to leave questions there. And we have someone who's gonna pull and copy those questions over into the Zoom chat as well. Um, so I think we're in for a, a good conversation. I wanna set the table a little bit for what Global Accessibility Awareness Day is. Um, this year marks the ninth um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And this is just right from their website. Um, the purpose of this day is to get everyone talking and thinking and learning about digital access and inclusion for people with all types of different disabilities. When you think about digital accessibility, here's the way they define it. Every user deserves a first-rate digital experience on the internet. Someone with a disability must be able to experience web-based services, content, and other digital products with the same successful outcome as those without disabilities. This awareness and commitment to inclusion is the goal of this day. And it, this is a global event that shines a light on digital access and inclusion for people with disabilities. The irony is not lost on me or us that given the current state of everything, we had to go to a digital format to talk about uh, and to kind of bring awareness on this Global Accessibility Day. And with that, there are different opportunities um, that come up. And one of those is that we get to engage people that we may not have other, otherwise been able to do. And so our guest today is an example of that, Chris Higgins. Um, before one, actually one quick second, I want to remind everyone that there's a closed captioning option too on the Zoom call. I forgot to mention that, so it is available at the bottom. And so if you're if you're interested in that, um, click on that feature. Our guest today is Chris Higgins. Uh, Chris is a freelance writer, podcaster, and radio reporter from Portland, Oregon. Chris has reported stories for This American Life, The Atlantic, Mental Floss, and others. And in 2015, 
produced Access, which is a short documentary film about accessibility. Chris, thank you so much for joining us and being here. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be here. It's a great privilege to speak to all of y'all, and I hope we have a good discussion. I know that we will. Uh, before we get into your experience about making the film Access, uh, give us a bit of your background on your work, and then, um, and then maybe tell us about the film and meeting Corey, um, and how that time in your creative work um, you know, evolved a little bit. Give us a little background on you. Sure. Uh, in my life, there's always been a tension between um, wanting to have a job that pays the rent and also wanting to be an artist and a storyteller. Um, so when I was in college, I studied uh, information design, which at the time they called library science. And the study there was how to access all of the world's information and how to organize all the information that we know in the world. To me, it was always, always very appealing to think about how could I find the answer to any question? Uh, after that, I went and got a job uh, in technology. And throughout that process of having a technology job, um, I very slowly swapped over into being a writer, a nonfiction writer. I tell true stories. So much of my writing has been uh, profiles in magazines. So you take a person doing something in the world and tell their story. And you try to tell it, I try to tell it, uh, truthfully and fully and with the, with whatever meaning can be found there. Um, over the last 20 years, my journey has been this swapping of technology into full-time storytelling. More recently, I've ended up being a, a documentary filmmaker. I've worked on a bunch of films. Uh, I've also done radio reporting. Um, this American Life uh, was a very interesting opportunity and in fact, um, that was a story about a, uh, well, I'll just say there's a movie called Ode to Joy that was adapted based on the reporting I did in, I believe, 2009 for This American Life. So there are a lot of movie things happening in my life related, again, to true stories. Um, and in some cases, those stories are about living with disability or living with illness or living with, you know, uh, any kind of human condition we have. Uh, I think today we'll be talking mostly about Access, which is a 13 minute long short film. Uh, long story short, Access is a movie that you can show to your friend, your boss, yourself, to raise awareness about what accessibility is, and furthermore, why it matters, and to a small extent, what you can do to make the things you make more accessible. And we'll get far more into that. But the idea there was to make something short enough that would raise awareness. This is a great topic for Global Accessibility Awareness Day uh, about this topic. And uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of where I am. Yeah, so tell us more about that, the process of making that film. So um, the, the subject in the film is Corey Joseph, I think that's correct? Correct. Um, and tell us more about, about meeting him, how that film, um, how that film came to be, and, and then get into your experience of making the film. Sure. Uh, every film, <laughs> every film has a journey. And this, this one was a little bit unusual. Uh, I actually started, I believe in 2014 or 15 and released it officially in 2019 or very early 2019. Um, so, what happened was <laughs> I had taken a part-time job with some friends working at a, an online meeting company, oddly enough. Uh, this was <laughs> eight years ago or something. And at one point they went through a process to make their meeting software. They're called Lucid Meetings. And they have a, an actually an excellent meeting pro uh, program, which is, you know, I mean, I'm not sponsored by them, but go take a look if you wish. Uh, they, well, and I had gone through a process to make their software accessible, um, meaning it was specifically accessible to people with disabilities. And, you know, we we're in this, this is a, a small company, you know, the person to my right is essentially like the, the one programmer, the person behind me is another programmer, the designer and sort of product lead is here, and I'm sitting at this little temporary desk in the middle. My job in that project was primarily 
to internationalize the software, to, to translate the things it said into a series of languages. That had little to do with the actual accessibility part. But as the days went on, as we went through this, and I would go and sit in, on these meetings about how to make uh, certain functions accessible to someone who's using a screen reader, for example, who may be able to hear the screen but not see the screen, I saw and felt the energy around me change. And I saw these people become, it's like they'd been converted, right? They had a, 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 a real change in heart where they said, this is really important stuff. This fundamentally changes how we think about making software. And we now believe having thought about it actually and talked to people who are affected by inaccessible software, that it is essentially a moral imperative that the things that we make must be usable by everyone, uh, especially people with disabilities. But I mean, we always try to make it easy to use but accessibility is about making it specifically, you know, easy to use or usable by people with disabilities. Um, and when I left that job to become a filmmaker and full-time writer and all that sort of stuff, uh, they said, we're gonna give you a grant and we want you to take this money and make a film about accessibility. Not about our company, not about what we did, just to do the, to try to, to, to help other people have that same realization. Um, so I set off to go make that film. I interviewed about a dozen professionals in the field, uh, people who do usability, usability work and, uh, you know, uh, modify websites or redesign websites so they work better uh, in, in many different cases. And in doing that, I put together a, I don't know, this is probably 30, 45 minute version of this film. I went to a conference in Denver, I showed the film, and it was a rough cut, you know, it was just, it was basically pieces of interviews stuck together based on theme. And I got this feedback. The feedback was, I love this film. This film is great. It was called Access. However, this film does not show anyone using accessible or assistive technology. And it appears to be a film aimed at accessibility professionals. <laughs> people who already know what accessibility is and who already care about it. Um, please go back to the drawing board was essentially the feedback. And so I sort of sighed having spent my entire grant and said, um, okay, uh, thanks. And went back to Portland. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Went to the local usability meetup and met, well, I asked around, there, there were people there I had already interviewed and said, is there anyone here who, anyone in this city uh, who I might be able to interview who is a user of, you know, accessible technology, assistive technology. And everybody I talked to said, go talk to Corey. Corey has a visual, disab a, a visual disability, he uses a seeing eye dog um, and a variety of other technologies and practices. And so went and had a, had a beer with him and he just laid it out. He said, I will show you what it is like to, you know, travel around the city to get my work done. And he works at, at the time he worked at uh, a large chip maker in the Pacific Northwest that we're not allowed to say the name of for contractual reasons. Uh, and then I believe he worked at Microsoft for a while. He might still be there. Um, you know, so very, very technical and accomplished guy. But I wanted to show not the technical part of it, but literally, so hey buddy, how did you get to my studio? Like physically, like how did that specifically work? Because I don't know, you know, like, so we walked that through in the film by following Corey around for a day. That day was actually, I believe, six or seven different shoots um, and interviewing him about what he thought that meant because I wanted this to be him talking about what he did and what it meant and what he wanted other people to know. Um, so that is primarily what the film is. I love one of the, one of the things I love about the, about the film when you watch it is just how, um, and in our conversations, Chris, I'll tell you that I, I found this, this theme mirrored in your creative process, which is where I want to go. But one of the things I loved about it was that 
just the kind of the honesty and the openness and really vulnerability of Corey when he's, um, you know, he's, he like walks in one building early on in the film and he's like, Oh, that's, that's the wrong one. And he goes to the next one and he's just, um, you know, he's just so honest about, you know, about how he's, how he's navigating that. And then that's really mirrored. I think, uh, it's, it's really mirrored in the way that you share your creative process. So reflect on that a little bit. I mean, because when you watch this film, it's not simply about someone who's using assistive technology, the film itself, is using assistive technology and allowing people of any any ability or disability to engage with that technology as well. Right. So I think the way I want to start to answer that is by the end of the film with Corey's own words. Um, this was, I think, the last, maybe the last day, and this may have been the last shot we did, but I essentially asked him and I'll get back to the thing you actually asked, but I think this is important context. I asked him, so, okay, what do you want people to do? Like, what do you think? Uh, and he sat back for a minute or two and just kind of thought about it. And then in, in one go, this is rare as a filmmaker that someone just says something that doesn't require any editing or cutting. He said, and I'm gonna quote here, I have this up on my screen. <clears throat> What I would ask people to do is ask themselves as they are creating, making, building, developing, can I enjoy this if? If I'm a little slower to use this, if I'm on a slow internet connection, if I'm blind, if I can't hear, if I'm on a 10 year old Blackberry, if flashes hurt my eyes and give me migraines, if I've never used a website like this, ask yourself, can I use this or enjoy this if? And essentially I just turned the camera off and you know, clapped and left. So I came at this as a documentary filmmaker who has made a bunch of short films from a perspective that did not ask myself those questions. I had primarily assumed that a documentary was a series of visuals with audio that went along with it and that it wasn't, I, I thought that I was my own viewer, right? Someone who can see, someone who can hear. And even though we had spent this all this time discussing this, discussing, you know, that th what closed, I mean, I, I understood closed captions, but, you know, we talked quite a bit about um, audio description and this is the practice, by the way, if you haven't come across it, of a narrator essentially speaking things that are purely visual. Um, I, the first time I actually ran into it in a mainstream way was one of those, um, one of the new Star Wars movies. I got a Blu-ray, I put it into the Blu-ray player, and the very first thing it says is, do you want audio description or not? And I said, what's that? Turn it on. <laughs> And it is a narrator saying, you know, some, they take the lightsaber out and they do that. Okay, so here's the problem. I go and I make this film. Uh, I edit it down. I make it as, as, as short and tight and packed together. And it's, it's got everything like great. And then I think, okay, I will add, I have closed captions. I'm, I did all that myself. I understand that. That's great. At the last minute, I thought, well, you know, I'll throw in that audio description part. I'll figure out how to do that. I'd never done that before, but I, you know, figured I would just figure it out. I, <laughs> I went and saw some examples of this and realized there is no place in the audio track. There is no breathing room, no time to speak the things that are visually conveyed. Now, a lot of the movie is Corey narrating himself as he does things. He's saying, I am touching this button. You can, you can infer without seeing the picture what's happening uh, without the need for a narrator to say, this is what's happening, right? But there are things that we would really benefit from knowing. For instance, in the opening shot, there's a guide dog sitting at his feet. You wouldn't know that. He never mentions it, right? Um, so I... <laughs> I had to re-edit the film, which takes a lot of effort, to, get, to open it up, to give more speaking time. Then I wrote this audio description narration 
and I'd never done this before. I was terrified. I was like, this is going to be a, no one's going to like this and it will be bad, but I'm out of, I'm out of money. You know, it's, this is my problem. I have to do it. Um, so I did it and I hired a friend of mine to record it and I cut it up into little chunks and stuck it in there. The next problem was, okay, well now I've got the audio description version and then I've got the other version. It's about a minute shorter with no audio description. They both have closed captions. And I'm like going along being like, okay, I'm gonna release this movie. It's gonna be cool. I'm gonna release the two versions. How am I gonna link these two versions together so that the people who don't need the audio description can find that one and the people who do can find that one. And I don't remember who it was that, <laughs> I don't know how this came about, but there was, there was a moment where I, I just realized, oh, you fool. <laughs> It's, you, you give the one with the audio description, only the one with the audio description. Don't, you know, the whole point of the movie is to make a movie that shows people in all these ways how it all works. And by including audio description in the only version of the movie that there is, I am helping to normalize the idea that that's something that exists, it's something that's valuable, and it's something that I, as a filmmaker, value so much that I'm just putting it in. Why wouldn't I, right? And that, that's a humbling experience because I thought I even knew what I was doing, right? And I'd already been at this for years, but this, this came down to the wire. I mean, I was pretty close to releasing two versions of this until all of a sudden I, you know, it was one of those sort of thinking in the shower sorts of moments where you think like, you know, I wonder, I could just release the one with the audio description and that would be better for everyone. And it's been, I, I was very, very pleasantly surprised by people saying this was a pretty good audio description, uh, sharing it as an example. Um, people asking me, how did you do it? And my answer was, I read a few web pages and I, you know, I watched the film and every time something occurred, I tried to think, is that something visual? It's not explained you know, in audio and I wrote a script. Yeah. I want to, I want to jump off of that point into, into another place in this conversation. That I think is really interesting. Tell me about, um, you know, as you, you're really kind of diving into the creative process, how you've worked through all of this are the many iterations of your work. Um, how has that thinking, that aha moment, that kind of uh, going back to the drawing board, that whole experience, how has that thinking about accessibility affected your creative work since then? Yeah, now we get to the problem of morality. Um, I think that in general, um, we as people sometimes confuse human rights, which are things that are conferred to you by virtue of just being a human. Uh, civil rights, those are things that a government grants to you and enforces. Um, and those things are different, right? So a lot of people look at what the civil rights situation is. What does the law require me to do? And they see that as the correct thing to do. Having this experience was a moral reckoning for me. And the, mor the moral issue for me was, if I, as an artist, make something that cannot be accessed by, you know, people who, you know, it's in my power to make this thing accessible. It is my moral duty to do so. That's a profound challenge for someone who makes, who's a photographer, who makes music, who makes films. What it means is I have accepted a responsibility to my fellow human beings. And I believe that this responsibility should be shared by people who make anything. And that's, that's kind of big. Um, we all make things, right? I'm not just talking to painters and, you know, although I, I have, by the way, talked to painters, photographers, cartoonists, um, who have made their work accessible. Um, but we all make things, we make recipes, we make, you know, everything around us is designed, although often we don't think about that design process. Like, you know, like the, my, my water bottle, someone designed this thing. There's a little folding mouth thing. Someone designed that and they made assumptions when they designed it. They made an assumption that someone would have the, 
the like the sort of finger dexterity to operate this thing. You can't access it, you know, with your teeth if it's closed. Someone designed the camera right here behind me. Someone designed all of this stuff. Um, because I am called upon to design films and, you know, all sorts of things, I believe it's a moral necessity to, to say in my design thinking, like that thing where I, 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 try, I had to make room for the audio description, I need to design the film to actually be accessible. I need to have there be a moment in my creation process where I sit back and think, what am I making? Is it actually going to be accessible to people? Um, and that's been, um, you know, it, it's, it's a change and it's not a, it's not like terrifying or anything, uh, but wow, what a change, right? And speaking to other people who make films, very few people reckon with this. Um, however, I've been very pleased to see so many people like the most common comment I get from people, especially like in business, technology people, or just people who work in offices, uh, upon seeing the movie, is they say, this changes how my business is going to work. Whatever it is we create, however it is we have meetings, uh, and so on. So that to me, that's so gratifying because I don't really want my moral judgment to be the only moral judgment, right? Like, however, I'm pretty confident that it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it's something I've taken on. So seeing other people take that on as well uh, has been gratifying. And, uh, and it just means that you have to consider what people, where people are coming from, right? If I were, if I were in charge of making these bottles, I would think about this, I would think about the width of the bottle, it's sort of tapered. I would think about all these little items and I have to think about them for films. Other people have to think about them for whatever it is you make. I think that's such a, um, I, the, to me, I love that point so much in that it really um, gets us into what this day is all about, right? This is about Global Accessibility Awareness Day specifically aimed at digital, um, you know, digital accessibility, but the point that you're making applies to anyone making anything. And I think that that is, you know, that is a profound, um, they, that is a, I think we did, I think we might've lost, sorry, we're gonna interrupt just a little bit talking about accessibility and we may have lost our interpreter. Um, so if it's useful to, you know, have the captions on, um, we're gonna keep keep going here. I trust that Lisa, you know, Lisa is uh, kind of our our woman behind the curtain, and she always makes these things go. So I will uh, trust that she's gonna help us figure that out. But I wanna, I just wanna acknowledge that the point that you're making strikes me as being so profound because it really is an it's it's a message for anyone making anything. Um, the the good news here, since we lost our interpreter, is that what I was saying is not actually that important. It's okay. It's, <laughs> she's back. Yeah, that's good. Welcome back. I'm glad she's here. Um, so, but on this Global Accessibility Awareness Day, which is aimed at digital content, I have a question about um, some digital media. You know, we were talking and I was thinking about this idea that, you know, so much digital media is created every day. I don't know all the, the stats and up-to-date, you know, data on that conversation, but something like more, you, you might even know, Chris, more data is produced today than was in the first X amount of years of human existence. I mean, it's like a crazy, really a mind-blowing thing. And that is because of um, our relationship to digital media. Um, and so, but as you think about that, everything from a, a tweet to an Instagram post or a Facebook post, and then even the, the various ways that someone might communicate within those platforms, right? Um, there's even, you know, different ways to communicate within those platforms to a, you know, a podcast or a video or a written blog. Um, and there's just so much more. I'm just, just scrape, sc you know, scraping at the surface there. There is this digital communication kind of cloud, no pun intended, swirling around us every single day. What are some of the ways um, 
some directions you could point us to, some tips, but what are some of the ways that each of us can produce content that is more accessible? I mean, I think about people that may be listening to this call um, and watching this webinar or listening to it in some way. And I think it would be really cool if we had a couple kind of easy next steps to take. So as you think about that, what, what tips might you have for us? Well, I have, um, I have kind of a master tip, which I don't know. I, I am not a usability professional. I just want to be clear about that. I'm a person who made a film about this and interviewed a lot of usability professionals. So I think I have an okay idea. Um, but because of the film, I've actually been brought in by companies to talk about this, this exact issue. Um, and the primary thing that happened to me in making the film is to, to address that question. Um, and if you go, by the way, to accessmovie.org, you can download or you know, view the streaming movie as video and sound with closed captions. You can download a file that is just the captions. You can download a Word file like Microsoft Word that is um, a descriptive transcript, which is essentially the captions plus the audio description plus some additional sort of scene setting. Um, it's basically a text version of a film. So here's the thing, and I think there actually are, there's, you can download an MP3 that's just the audio of the film, because frankly, that works too. Um, what, I, what happens when I talk to people who make something is I say, if there's a way to, to render what you're making as text, then you're very likely to reach people who have accessibility needs. And when I say text, I'm saying, so for example, if you make uh, a podcast, right? The podcast is spoken and I hosted a podcast for nine months uh, ending very recently. And I insisted that we have a transcript. Now it was me writing the podcast, delivering the podcast every day, every weekday as a news podcast. So the way I dealt with that issue was I wrote a script and I read the script. And if I change the script in my reading of it, I change that line and we publish that script every day. So we had a transcript. Now the transcript has many uses, right? Like one thing is if you cannot listen to podcasts, you can read the transcript, but also it's there so that Google can search for terms that I've used. It's there so that you get, I mean, honestly, there are a lot of times that I would rather dip into the notes or the written version of something rather than like, you know, scrubbing through a long, audio thing, um, there, there are advantages you might not know about, right? And so if you're working with something, you know, like let's say you have a, a new employee coming into your business and that person has an accessibility need and you just have, you don't know where to start. Uh, I think the way to start is to think, what is it that we are, that we're grappling with and is there a way to turn it into text? Now, a second, order problem there is what is text? If you go online right now, uh, especially on, on Twitter, but really on, on Facebook as well, there are many cases of people posting photographs of text, right? Like a, like a picture, a screenshot with lots and lots of words in it, usually to get around the fact that you can't write very many letters in a tweet or whatever. Uh, there was a time when we were shooting Access actually uh, with Corey where he said, you know, using Facebook is, is very difficult right now because this is such a common phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these are inspirational quotes, sometimes these are other things. But at the time, and this has changed a little bit for the better since then, uh, when he would get to one of those images, the screen reader would, would read aloud to him and simply say, image. Okay, what are the contents of the image? Picture of text. Oh, oh, how helpful. Great. Right, great. Picture of text. Like, you want to give me some words from that text? No, can't do that. <laughs> so you had a situation where someone was earnestly trying to share a message, right? Like they'd, they'd gone to the trouble of writing it down, but the way they shared it, the mm -hmm. fact that it wasn't text, it was a photograph of text, meant that Corey can't read the text. And Corey can read text. So it, it was such a simplistic thing, right? Like if you had just written that same thing, copied it from Word or whatever and pasted it, even if it had to be two, three, four, five, six, seven tweets, or you had to sure. link over somewhere else, 
that would have been so much more useful. And also the people who can read photographs of text can still read it. Um, so that's the first thing I would say is essentially think about whether you can uh, take the thing you're making and make it into text. And the second thing is try to put yourself in the shoes of someone, for instance, Corey or someone else who is actually walking through a process for the first time. And a key example I give of this is uh, if you're following a recipe, if you're cooking, I don't know if you've had this experience, but I, it's happened to me a lot. You get to step four and they say, okay, put in your fully chopped this, 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 and this into your saucepan. You're already like there's fire and there's cooking happening and you were unaware that some previous thing had to have happened. Now, if you were a chef or somebody who cooked a lot, you probably would have thought, oh yeah, I should probably chop that tomato or that, you know, tomato or onion or whatever. I might not think that because I'm very naive in that sense. So starting out by saying, step one, you're going to have to chop all these things. Then when you get to step five and you have to throw them into the flaming pan, you're ready to do that. Basically having a beginner's mind, you know, when you come into these things, come into it as someone other than yourself. Imagine you are someone else. Yeah, I mean, you really are speaking to um, like really reverse engineering several different people's experience and working through that. And that's, you know, it's certainly something that can be made habitual. You can turn it into the way that you approach all of your work, any recipe that you share, any podcast that you begin creating. Um, but it is certainly something that we have to be really thoughtful about. I have a question for you, but I want to remind everyone, uh, if you have a question, um, I would encourage you to put, put them in the chat here on Zoom or on Facebook. Uh, we have one that I'll get to in a second. Um, that Chris just kind of kind of touched on, uh, but I have, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this. You know, I, that that is such a funny thing. Pictures of text is funny to me, um, but I want to flip that around. Talk to me about the something that I've seen people um, becoming much more comfortable with is actually captioning photos uh, in a real way. You and I had an interesting conversation about that that made me rethink with how much detail we caption those photos. I mean, to say simply, you know, woman sitting at the beach, uh, that might be okay. Uh, you know, woman sitting in chair is less helpful than um, sitting in a chair at the beach. Talk to me about that a little bit. How, how, how have you come to think about um, something that all of us can do? I mean, I, chances are I'm gonna post a picture on Instagram um, this, you know, this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, I might do something like that, post it on Facebook or whatever. Tell me how you've come to think about that. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of what this gets down to is empathy, right? Uh, having a, a real sense of someone else's feelings and experience um, and caring about that, right? I think that we're all capable of that. We just might not necessarily think it's important to whatever we're doing. Okay, so once this had all happened, once I made the film and I was in this process of realizing like, oh, Corey is on Instagram and follows me. Doesn't, it, it shouldn't take having a visually impaired person who is your friend follow you on Instagram to make this happen. It shouldn't take that, but that's what it took for me. Um, but all of a sudden I said, oh, wow, uh-oh. When I post a picture, I am not bothering, I'm writing a little like, you know, a couple of words but beneath it, assuming that someone has visually seen the picture, taken in all of the context they can take in and see my comment. I am not, you know, my little words below the thing are usually almost a joke about what the thing is in the picture. There is a feature in Instagram on your phone. Uh, it's sort of hidden. You have to go into like this extra thing and it's called alt text, alternative text. Tap that and if you don't do it, and it, often software will attempt to describe what it thinks it sees, what the computer can kind of make out. And very often this is the automatic text will be something like, you know, person or two people, or, you know, person sitting in chair or cat. Like, okay, that's, that's descriptive a little bit. But what occurred to me is that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a photographer, I take it seriously. I like photography. I think photography is, a, is its own art form. But there's a lot of poetry you can put into an alt text thing, right? The, the, 
add a little bit of poetry. So if what the photograph is, is let's say my cat, I take a lot of pictures of my cat. I have a very large, very large cat. Um, I'm trying to communicate, you know, the, the ineffable thing. So I'm trying to say, you know, a gray cat sits regally among a wilderness of indoor plants with light streaming in behind him. He looks at the camera with one eye, something like that. That's about enough to describe one of these photographs. Sometimes they're much longer because the photograph itself has so much going on. Um, but I'm trying to describe the effect of the image, like, and describing the effect of what light is, um, can be complex, but you can, you can describe moods, of course, right? This is a warm image. This is an image that is springtime, right? Like I yeah, take pictures lately of in Portland, Oregon, everything is blooming and it's also constantly raining. So I'm posting pictures of, you know, like the, the roses are blooming and there's raindrops all over them. And so I'm able to describe that, I think fairly accurately, like a, a, a vibrant, large rose uh, in full bloom is covered with raindrops and behind it is a soggy, you know, a, sort of a soggy garden patch. It's messy. Uh, that describes the feeling and the intent and the mood of what you would see in a, a textual way. And there is a great hope among people who, you know, work in this world that by doing, by giving good human descriptions to scenes like this, we may help the computers to understand what they're looking at down the line, right? I don't ever expect the computers to be poets, right? Or to, to be excellent writers, but perhaps by conveying a little bit more mood, you're certainly helping people today. Um, and you might be helping someone else later on down the line. It's also quite interesting, by the way, after you've done hundreds of these to realize what you can do by searching, right? So once you have all this text, you can search through it and say like, what are all the ones that have cats? What are all the ones that have a certain feeling name? What are all the ones that talk about light or talk about warmth or talk about coldness or snow? Um, which is sort of difficult if you just have a pile of pictures. I'm working on a film right now, actually. Let me grab a little visual aid here. Um, I'm We're working gonna on put you to the test to see how well you describe this visual. Well, I'm working on a film about Polaroid images, okay? So it's, let's pick an example here. Boy, these are terrible. Okay, great example. So I will attempt to show this to the screen. Uh, this is not a very good Polaroid picture, but I, I posted this somewhere. And what this image shows in my opinion is, I think I would say outdoors, a giant pile of dirt. The dirt crumbles and falls down the front. It's shaped somewhat like a pyramid or a slanting, you know, crumbling thing behind trees. Something like that, right? And also, if you look very closely, you can see that there's a, you can't see this probably online, but there's a fence post that shows the height of this pile is probably, you know, six feet. Um, so I have one of the problems in working on this film, uh, I have 7,000 Polaroid images, 7,000. Uh, and so having to describe them uh, is, it's a big task, but it's doable. And it allows, the it allows at least something of that what was a, a, a purely visual experience to be communicated to everyone um, and if those polaroids are ever put up in a gallery space somewhere for example um, i want someone to go to the gallery and to be able to have that gallery experience why not right um, i've worked in museum design before and, and making sure that all of those things that are physically in the space are accessible um, it is possible. You just kind of have to think about it from other people's perspectives or from your own perspective, just modified slightly. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great story. And I, I love that you kind of pulled an example up here. Um, before I ask the question that's in the chat, I have one quick question you just sparked with me. 
Um, did you, um, so I'm, I'm talking to someone who's a documentary filmmaker who has an, a pretty significant appreciation for cats. Are you behind the Tiger King series? Are you the one who created that? <laughs> Uh, I did live in Florida for 13 years. Uh, Why did you not tell us until just now? I don't, that's something you should lead with. I didn't make Tiger King. I've seen Tiger King. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, no. I, I, well, so a much better, a better question we have here from Melody. Um, and you talked about podcasts earlier, but she said, I'm researching podcasts. Can you suggest equipment accessible for people with disabilities? So I'm assuming this is for the recording end. Um, and the short answer is, unfortunately, no, I don't know. Uh, the, the longer answer, which is, I think, more helpful, is there is a community of podcasters. Um, I find them on Twitter um, who work with this problem or challenge or whatever every day. Uh, so there are, when you make a podcast, right, I have, the, I have the, the, this big fancy microphone and it's got all this stuff going on. And it's frankly quite complicated. Um, one of my former jobs, I was an audio engineer in college. So I learned how to plug the plugs and do the things and all that stuff. But, you know, none of this stuff was designed to be, and anyway, all of this stuff was designed essentially in the fifties and sixties and just sort of like continues on. Um, but I would say that the, the way to get this answer is to go probably onto Twitter and look for accessibility uh, podcasts. Um, there's a guy, Stephen Aquino, uh, I believe his last name is spelled A-C-Q-U-I-N-O. I hate to call out Stephen, but he's a friend. Um, he reports on accessibility for, I'm now forgetting which publication, but it's some big publication. And he has done a podcast. So, you know, it is essentially his, his beat, his reporting beat to talk about what are these tools? You know, what are good tools for making a podcast? Um, if you have accessibility needs. Now those needs might be motor needs, they might be cognitive needs, they might be visual, like there's all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, and anyway, that, that's the thing I found is that there's a community on the internet who tend to know specific answers to those things. The other side of that is transcripts. When you complete the podcast, um, I would suggest either making a transcript yourself if you can. It is a difficult and specific skill. Um, I am not very good at it, um, but if I slow the audio down and take my time, I can get there. Um, there are some computer-based services that kind of help. Um, and there are, you know, I mean, if you can, which most people cannot because it's expensive, you can hire someone. Um, I've worked with transcriptionists as a, you know, for everything in my career has involved working with transcriptionists. So as a reporter, if I come back with three hours of interview, I really want someone else to give me the whole, you know, uh, the whole thing as text. So I just want to chime in here really quickly. You know, we have, I'm looking at the, the attendees, we have a good group of people, um, which I just think is awesome on here. And really, I, I have a strong respect and appreciation for the tech creative community in Toledo. Um, and we have several uh, people I can tell on the, on the call. Uh, my buddy Keith Instone um, just dropped a link in the chat, accessible.fm. Um, and that's, so- that's you know, Steven's I, podcast, yeah. Perfect, there you go. Um, and so there's a lot of, it, it's, it's just, it's cool. I think one of the things that's exciting to me about this conversation um, for Global Accessibility Awareness Day is that you really, all of us see that there's this community of creators that where this, when this value sinks in deep and takes root, um, it, it really spreads, it spreads across, you know, and becomes more of, more of the norm. And I think that's a really hopeful, hopeful thing. I have one last question from, uh, that I'm seeing here on the Facebook chat actually, or the comments I should say. Um, and it says, it's from Anna. And she said, hi, it would be so great to get an overview how it is possible to convert various types of Facebook posts to be accessible. I couldn't find out, for instance, how to add alt text to a photo carousel, for example. To start, it would be great to get an overview which posts can be accessible and which cannot. Um, 
so she's and then in parentheses she says photo video slideshow album carousel instant experience various types of ads i'm just curious i know we're, we're kind of running short on time i was curious if you had any um thoughts to add to that question well so this is i do here's part of the issue that i run into i am not an expert in the accessibility of facebook specifically right i know that individual images can be given alt text it's certainly possible that a carousel of images maybe not. Um, I do know that, you know, Googling how do I edit the alternative text for a photo on Facebook um, claims that I can do it for a photo. Now, I don't know if that applies to other types of, of imagery. Having said that, I did make a series of, of short films that were for uh, the magazine Mental Floss. There are like a dozen of them. And I, that, that overlapped with the creation of access. And so in the middle of them, and I think you, you've all encountered this, there is a, a, a thing that began happening where people would put uh, open captions, meaning that the text is burned into the bottom of the video and the video would start auto playing. The idea being that if someone hasn't turned their sound on, that's the original intent. The person didn't turn the sound on in the video, but they still wanna get the visuals and the text that's you know, going with it. That is something that's like a cultural thing that happened. Uh, ultimately positive. I think though that the issue with open captions in many cases is you can't translate them um, or not as easily. Uh, and like depending on the platform, right? Like YouTube versus Vimeo versus Facebook, each of them has different limitations regarding things like alternate audio tracks. So for example, um, you can create for one video uh, on Vimeo, which is the service I prefer, you can create additional audio tracks. So one could be a translation, one could be one that has, I don't know, had, like you, you could in theory have one without an audio description and one with an audio description. If you go to any Netflix show, go up there in the audio thing and you will have audio description because they are required to do that. Um, so if you're making videos, um, I would suggest trying to add text into that video in whatever form you can. I prefer closed captions because typically that means the person using it can turn those on or off. And I use closed captions. I watch television with closed captions just on. Um, I think that for imagery, and by the way, there's a, a related question I think that's coming up here, which is, I, I think I'd boil it down to say, you know, what if someone who is writing the caption for an image, right. you know, like what it, sort of, there's a tension. And I, I basically, the question is saying, um, there's a tension between giving a complete and beautiful and, you know, accurate to the, to the mood um, text version of an image versus just letting the image speak for itself. And that, I agree, there is a tension. And this, like, you know, this Polaroid is an object that's not the same as text describing the object, but it's something. The text is something. I, I think from my, from my perspective, um, trying to be descriptive in the way that you can or working with someone who you think is potentially, you know, very skilled at that, who is, you know, wants to describe images uh, is the way to go. Um, and by the way, we haven't quite touched on this, but it, it's, you know, making this film has had a profound impact on my other filmmaking. And at this point, it's very difficult or impossible really to justify making a film without just, you know, just audio description, of course, closed captions. Um, and it's impossible to justify posting images to my uh, Instagram without also doing that. So every time I post, I give it a shot. And I, I guess what I'd say is, uh, yeah, I'm a professional writer, right? So I feel comfortable writing these things. It's not, right? Like, I, I understand that it doesn't come easily right. to everyone. Um, but I would say, um, please give it a shot. Because I think that giving it a shot and trying to be descriptive of mood um, is probably better than, it's certainly better than not. And it's certainly, I think, better to give a slightly wrong or different impression than no impression. And the thing I would add to that, I mean, Landon, I know Landon pretty well. It's so interesting 
you know, leave it to Landon to drop a little philosophical question right there in the, in the Q and a, uh, but I appreciate it. I mean, that tension exists. I think that um, in all of our conversations about accessibility, I think the macro view of it all showing that as a human species, we're evolving and getting better every day in our pursuit of accessibility. So 10 years from now, will it be good enough to simply, um, you know, have the person who took the photo and posted it to social media also then try to narrate or offer a text description of it? Maybe not, but is it better? Is it, I mean, I think that's the point you're making, Chris, is it better than what we currently have? So I appreciate that. There's some really cool uh, comments in the chat here and links, you know, I, I love that the Facebook question that Anna asked, um, Rachel, Rachel Ryan jumped in and, and, and put a link um, that, that Facebook has there. So what's cool, I think, that we're seeing even in this conversation is how um, community um, is, is the way that we move forward together, right? Um, and speaking of community, as we kind of finish this up, before I thank Chris so much for, for being here, I just want to say that as, as the Ability Center, when we think about the future that we are determined to create, um, standing on a firm foundation of a hundred years of service to uh, people with disabilities, anyone um, you know, nearby in our, in our area of service. As we stand on that foundation of a hundred years and we dream about um, how we can create the most disability friendly community in the country, um, we cannot do that without more awareness around digital accessibility and without more um, community kind of all of us sharing tips and tricks and pushing that conversation forward. So that was our hope here today um, to everyone who attended, to everyone on Facebook, to everyone who signed up to get this video and to watch it later. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of that community. And Chris, I mean, you know, what we haven't even said yet is we started this at 10 a.m. Eastern time, which is 7 a.m. your time. Uh, and your commitment to this and sharing your story uh, and your kind of vulnerable creative journey really means a lot to us. And we're really thankful that you could be a part of this with us today. So thank you, Chris. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. Just wanted to mention that the movie is completely free. You may show it, you may display it, you may do whatever you wish. You may download a file, you can use it in your classroom. Um, and all of those items are out there at accessmovie.org. There are also links there to resources on certain specific topics. So if you're saying, I have a website, I need help getting started with this, um, or whatever, um, there are a bunch of links there. And if there's an area, for example, podcasting, I should probably go after this and go add a section on podcasting, okay? So uh, you can also reach me at chrishiggins.com. So I appreciate awesome. this opportunity, will... it's a privilege. and. Talk to you soon. Thank you. We will send out we'll send out links and, and and all of that information too when we send this out to people who signed up for it. Um, yeah. So thanks, Chris. Thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks to everyone who helped put this together.